federal, state, and local level. Um, are you familiar with the Purge Act, what the yield curve is? Weren't you like that, you know, finance guy too? I was a business teacher. Yeah. And then what was your background? Real estate. Yeah. Just, just numbers and investments. Okay. So you know what the curve is? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. I knew it. I knew it at one point. Okay. I need a okay. refresher. Okay. So basically the yield curve is U.S. Treasury securities. Yeah. Okay. The curve is, in most cases, upward sloping, which is a normal curve. Yeah. Okay. You got maturity here. And then you got your three months, six months, nine months, you know, one year, five years, seven years, 10 years, 30 year, 10, 20, 30. Okay, mm -hmm. so the curve is upward sloping because the equation, this is the Fisher equation, that basically says that nominal interest rates, mm -hmm. and this is going to be your year, yield to maturity, okay, or your interest rate. Yeah. Okay, and then you have, you know, different interest rates for different maturities along the curve. Okay. And I'm using terminology here. Yeah. And tell me if I'm... Yeah. Okay. And the theory is, is that the yield curve is upward sloping because the equation to determine nominal interest rates is going to be the real rate plus inflation expectations. Okay. And the real rate is normally pretty much low and constant. Mm -hmm. It doesn't move very much. But inflation expectations move on a daily basis, depending on information. So if inflation expectations go up, interest rates go up. Inflation expectations go down, and interest rates go down. Okay. And with a normal curve, your inflation expectations are positive. When the yield curve is flat, it's zero. And when it's inverted, it's negative. So what you're seeing now is the curve is basically Going like that. So inflation expectations are coming down because Trump can't get his policies through. Mm -hmm. So the market's basically saying that we're not going to see the stimulus right. that we're going to get. It's not going to be inflationary. We're actually going to see lower inflation. So the yields on the medium and longer term mm -hmm. treasuries have started to come down. Mm -hmm. And the Fed has basically said it's going to continue to raise short term interest rates. And one of these on the this X axis, that's the yields maturity, but just generally numbers, that's going to be like yeah, two, so three, that's four like percent. the like the ten year yeah. is what uh, two and three eighths. Okay. I think they just sold a seven yeah. billion dollar ten year okay. today or yesterday, and they did yeah. uh, two and two and three eighths. Mm -hmm. It's got as low as like two point one, two point yeah. two, okay. particularly after Brexit, yeah. and now it's right around there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the one year, you know, the the shorter term that the money market, shorter term instruments have started to move up too. Okay. Okay. Yeah, right. um, so this is Fed driven uh, right yeah. here, and this yeah. is market driven right here. And you got not only is the Fed raising interest rates, okay, <clears throat> and it's not raising interest rates because of inflation, they're raising interest rates because of stock market and real estate market bubbles. And yeah. usually the Fed moves in mm -hmm. late in the cycle, and they've been known to raise interest rates if the economy overheats, but also raise interest rates if the stock and the real estate market become bubble form. Mm -hmm. okay? They try to prick yeah. the bubble uh, uh, gently, Early. but the problem is, is that they've admitted already, Janet Yellen's already admitted, she admitted it last summer, that the Federal Reserve has been basically the cause of every single recession post-World War II. Because they oversell Agreed. the bonds yeah. on their balance sheet. And they got $4.5 trillion right now yeah. uh, on their balance sheet. And they're already talking about unwinding it. And if they unwind the balance sheet too quickly, which they could because they've done it before in the, fa in the mm -hmm. past, it'll flatten the curve anymore and it actually cause it to invert. Once you invert it. Professor probably knows exactly all this. <laughs> once you invert it, and I got it right here. What did you teach? What was your thought business? So here's. Here is, of course, yeah. you did it. There it is. So, if you go up to stock charts, and you can just go into Google and type yeah. in um, the dynamic yield curve. Yeah. It basically shows the, uh, the yield curve uh, against the uh, S&P 500 index. And this is, I show this to all of my students. Because when you start to reach 
peaks in asset price bubbles. This is just using the stock market, which is a leading indicator. What you start to see is the yield curve starts to flatten and inverts right before the peak. Mm -hmm. And then as you start to move into a recession and the market starts to correct, uh, then the Fed comes in, starts to buy the yield curve on the short end, driving up bond prices, driving down interest rates to try to stimulate the economy and put a floor on the, the stock market and the real estate market. Mm -hmm. So usually in here, the yield curve is very steep, okay, because they're just buying a ton of bonds, injecting liquidity into the system and driving down the cost of capital, both for equity, for debt, for mortgage, mm -hmm. to start stimulating. Now watch this, you'll see the curve is steep, but as we start to move into the recovery phase, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. the Fed starts selling off the, the, the bonds and starts to cause interest rates to go up, and you can see it's starting to flatten yeah. as you start to approach the, yeah. the peak. Now it, it looked like it inverted right there, but watch, it'll just invert any second now. Now, it inverted, and then the peak was about a year later in the stock market. And we were in a recession within 24 months. That's, oh, that is the recession. Yeah, and if you go back in time, the yield curve has been one of the best predictors of, uh, of the business cycle. Yield curve, okay. So the, the thing that's pro problematic now is you can see the resistance points in the stock market, and you can see the supports uh, based on the last two cycles. And it's been, if you go back further, it's been pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is if you, you can see that we broke through the prior resistance, the prior peaks here in 2013. <clears throat> and what you'll see too is that the yield curve has remained extremely steep. Okay, it's only been recently that the yield curve has started to flatten and potentially invert. So what the Fed did, which it always seems to do, is it leaves interest rates too low for too long. It creates asset price bubbles, uh, both in real estate and the stock market, and potentially the commodity market. And in the bond market, if interest rates are too low, mm -hmm. so you have basically asset price bubbles. Mm -hmm. And eventually the Fed's going to pop them. Mm -hmm. And they do it every single time. And we're, and we're late this time. So we're late. This, we're about a year past a the year. average yeah. recovery peak phase of the business yeah. cycle. So it just increases the probability of a recession. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. So that's kind of the first uh, dynamic. And then the, the second one, which is really the thesis. That I've been working on to get some clarity because again you're right most economists don't come up with definitive <clears throat> answers to, to things. What I did was I went back and I looked at the um, at the business cycle over time post World War II. Because I you know as an economist I want to be able to forecast the markets and I want to be accurate you know, with the what the cycle looks like, because then I can advise my clients right. tactically and mm -hmm. strategically, you know, and how to start moving the portfolio or implementing yeah. some policies for defensive strategies. So what I did was I went back to 1940, and I, I could have gone back, you know, 150 years if I wanted to, which I did, but I used this data because it was easier, and I used non-farm employment. So this is year-over-year non-farm employment, growth rates on a monthly basis. So I tried to create some cyclicality. And as you can see, the cyclicality is, it looks like there's a pattern here in the cyclicality. So what I did was I broke up uh, the decades from 40 to 50, 50 to 60 in 10 year blocks, 10 year increments. And then I bisected them into five year increments. And then what I did was I went back and I coded all of the recessions and I coded all the growth peak phases within the business cycle using labor, non-farm employment labor as the tracking index. I could use GDP, but that comes out on a quarterly, and I could have used industrial production, but get the same results. Um, so what I did was I went back, coded the recessions, coded the growth peak phases, and realized that there was a recession within the first five years, or recessions within the first five years of almost every single decade, except for 08 and 58. And we were in the growth peak phase of the business cycle in the last five years, uh, of every single decade. So the 08 recession and the 58 recession and the 28 recession was in the last five years of the decade. Okay, But all the other recessions were in the first five years of every single decade. So there's a higher probability of a recession now just based on probability of between April of 2018 and a April of 2019. 
because we're one year beyond, and a lot of the stimulative policies that were supposed to be enacted by the Trump administration ain't going to get done. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there's so much debt out there, both private debt and sovereign debt, that's sucking in a lot of the uh, the capital that could be used for consumption and investment is just not going to be there. It's going towards debt service. So the the economy is more fragile now. Mm -hmm. Okay, in this phase. So I'm predicting a mild recession for 2018-19, but a severe recession by 2021 through 23. Mm -hmm. Because we've had recessions 90% of the time in the first five years of every decade. Okay. So, so how many years is that? Consistent with your first five years. Yep, that's it. Yeah. So 90% probability within the first five years of every decade. That's pretty high. Yeah. And growth peak in the last five years of every decade. Yeah. But we have, we've now had the 08 recession. And the 08 recession bled, bled through all the way to 13. Yeah. So it still confirms the, basically yeah. the theory. Yeah. Okay. Um, and now you have this flat being going on. The Fed's raising the rates. But again, they got to unwind the $4.5 trillion balance sheet that they currently manage. They said they're going to do it, and I know they're going to mess it up and sell too much, too much of the bonds and invert the curve mm -hmm. at some point, and then that's it. So that's kind of the uh, the strategy, okay, from a macro view. What political strategy is there to do this? What's the difference between the prior political oh, mindset? Great. Am I in the right place? Yes. That's exciting. Cool. Come on in. Uh -huh. To, to think about the political motivations, because there was maybe there's maybe a change that's occurring in political motivations, and I don't know. It doesn't sound like it sounds like we're still late. We're still missing it. We're well, still here's, here's the know, problem. recession prone. Here's the problem with the politics, and I'm also a political scientist. Here's the here's the problem with the politics. I'll just jump around with you guys. That way I can customize the presentation. It just seems like interest rates should be jacked up way it should have been if we were They were. The, the interest rates did move after the election. There just was a, a shift bit. in the curve. Yeah. Um, I'm but a like lot back of that up to six and seven. I mean I'm not talking no, up that to four. Happen again. No. No, okay. No, I don't know. No, I for my calculation, um, because of just the, the amount of our accommodation and the printing and just the bias by the Fed. Yeah. Uh, and we're not really we don't have an inflation problem, mm -hmm. really. Uh, we have a deflation problem. Okay, so falling prices is really yeah. the issue, yeah. not rising prices. So a seven percent ten year yeah. is highly improbable, mm -hmm. and I think that the highest it could probably go in the next cycle yeah. is probably four. That's still not, relatively low. Right. I guess not the ten year itself, but just rates related to real estate. And I'm sorry, I, I that's okay. think of it from real estate standpoint. That's, no, but that's the fine. Real estate interest rates would be the treasury ten year plus a spread. Yeah, and I for residential it's like 150 basis points yeah. on top of the ten year. Right. On top of the ten year. That's okay. the way. I, and I, I have another slide. For yeah. Okay. But here's the policy problems, um, and I use the mean voter theorem in public choice. I don't know if you're familiar with this theory, but I, I find it very accurate in kind of articulating the dynamics of the, the politics and the policy. And we had basically a major rightward shift in politics over the last 30 years. Um, and you can just, I use uh, the presidency as the demarcation. And it wasn't really until, you know, Reagan came in that really kind of pushed things, you know, to the right, but still, we were still operating within a right of center political ideology, so the Democrats and the Republicans weren't that far apart. So they could actually push through comprehensive policy together. Okay, it wasn't really until, you know, cable TV really mobilized a, a right wing coalition, mm -hmm. you know, to get them to the voting booth because mm -hmm. the left was more fractured and disaffected, and that allowed them to basically take control mm -hmm. and really move and shift the political spectrum even further to the right. And it was really Bush too in Fox News, where you had mass media in a democratic society, quoting Noam Chomsky, uh, that really pushed the spectrum even further to the right. And then you had a, a disaffection amongst the Republican Party and the emergence of the Tea Party. And then you also had the emergence of the Koch brothers and other uh, private interests um, that were had direct influence in the policy process through the Republican Party. And now you, with, the, with Trump, he he captured and moved the spectrum even further to the right, 
where really the majority of the population, if you survey the population, they're actually going to be left of center, but not everybody votes. You have to have a certain education level and a cognitive level to actually participate in a democracy. <clears throat> so it used to be right of center, but the population is left of center, but they don't, a lot of people don't vote. So the people who do vote are right of center, but the whole shift under Bush too, and particularly Trump, has now moved, particularly the Republican Party, even further to the right. Well, how do you define center? What's the definition, non-politically, just, just... Yeah, this uh, would be, this is where what, the Democrats the, were, you know, know, were on, from a social standpoint, a social fiscal standpoint? A, a Keynesian uh, economics. Okay, I've heard and, of it. What so is Keynesian? Keynesian economics basically believes that government, yeah. and particularly government spending, yeah. um, could actually uh, promote economic growth right. if it is channeled correctly. Yeah. So it's a belief in government, yeah. you know, in the ability okay. of government through the bureaucracy to be able to deliver yeah. both public and private goods okay. to a broad spectrum of the population. So you have the faith in government left and non-faith in government. And liberal markets, right. supply-side economics. On the right. Okay. Which is so mostly the, the mantle that has been taken up by the Republican yeah. Party. Got it. So it's basically an ideological battle between mm -hmm. the two parties. Keynesian Democrats, yeah. and you have uh, uh, liberal supply side Republicans, and they battle it out in the political sphere. Yeah. And it's winner take all at this point. Yeah. They used to be more closely, closer together to be able to formulate broad based, yeah. pluralistic, right of center policies, yeah. <laughs> but now they're battling it out. And it's a winner yeah. take all because we're talking about a $20 trillion a year economy. Yeah. So the economics are massive, mm -hmm. and that's why they're so ruthless mm -hmm. and so brutal. And they're not willing to, to work with each other. Yeah, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. But that's where we're like way in the red. <laughs> over yeah, there. we're over here. But the pro problem is, is that businesses can't, um, I cannot plan yeah. in the next four to eight years, no or at yeah. least the next two years, no when you have so much um, uh, political uncertainty. Right. And my thesis, my thesis is also, and, this, and I started noticing this years ago, um, and came to the conclusion, and these are just, you know, we're all real estate guys and real estate people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can be a real estate guy. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's awesome. um, the way I looked at it is I couldn't figure out what was driving asset values for real estate up and down, okay? And I used just a basic equation, okay? Uh, this is the income capitalization approach. You know, it's net operating income divided by the cap rate. You know, it's going to give you the value. Okay, or I could do a discounted cash flow. If I know the future cash flow streams, I can discount those back to the present and get the present value. Okay, so you got a numerator and you got a denominator. Okay, well the numerator I figured out um, is highly correlated to the overall business cycle. So I can do a pretty good job of forecasting net operating income growth rates because they go with GDP and employment, okay? And that moves relatively slowly. The hard thing to, to be able to forecast is the discount rate, okay? What is the discount rate? Well, the discount rate, my expected rate of return or my required rate of return or my hurdle rate or however you want to call it, is basically, if you're using the risk premium approach, it's the risk, it's gonna be the uh, risk-free rate, which is the real rate plus inflation expectations, and you start adding on these risk premiums. So if I'm an investor and I'm gonna go invest, I'm probably gonna start with the 10 or 20 year treasury yield and start adding on some risk premiums to get to what my expected return or my discount rate's gonna be. <clears throat> you're gonna have some kind of inflation risk premium, you'll have some credit risk premium, particularly if you're using bond financing or your tenant credit risk embedded in the portfolio of the project. Mm -hmm. You have an illiquidity risk premium. Real, real estate doesn't transact, I mean, if I'm going to try to broker a $20 million transaction, I can't just trade $20 million in stock yeah. in IBM and do it in two, two minutes. Uh, it's going to take me a while to be able to do a $20 million transaction. So I have to add on an illiquidity risk premium. Uh, real estate is long dated maturity. It has a long economic and physical life. And that allows it to be impacted by exogenous or external factors that can affect the, the property's cash flows. 
Um, if you're looking at foreign capital coming in or you're looking at international investment, you got to take into consideration exchange rate risk between the currencies. Uh, in 2013, uh, there was modifications to the capital gains tax, went up, income taxes went up, Obama uh, care tax was implemented. So there was a lot of tax motivated sales at the end of 2018 to arbitrage because people knew taxes were going up. So they were going to take the hit. And with tax legislation uh, basically in the mix again, uh, the tax risk premiums, in my view, should be increased mm -hmm. also. But what we've done is we've used these risk premiums on top of the risk-free rate to get the discount rate, to get the rates of return and the present values and net present values. Mm -hmm. But until recently, we didn't even include political and policy risk premiums. And I started to hear, um, I think Goldman Sachs uh, wrote this, uh, and this was at least within the last, since March. They said more than 30% of high-grade corporate bond investors listed populism and politics as their biggest concern for the next 12 months. So now what investors are doing are, are actually adding political and policy risk premiums um, to their investment decisions because it's so volatile. Sure. So. Do you mind? Do you, do you provide any slides? Do you mind if I no, take a quick picture of that? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the full it. deck. You would. Okay. Yeah, that's great. That's great information. Just I, I just had a discussion Sunday about what is the cap rate, and I always describe it as kind of the cost of capital plus a bunch of yeah, risk premiums. Yeah, so there's premiums. Be, I didn't know how to describe it very well. You're going to have location. Yeah. You're going to have um, it's, it's functional yeah. obsolescence and physical right. deterioration component. You're going to yeah. have tenant credit, yeah. risk premiums in there, and maybe mm -hmm. other. There might be local yeah. policy, yeah. either taxation sure. or zoning right. modifications that could yeah. be a policy component that, that needs it's to be taken into consideration. It's funny you spend a lifetime using the cap rate in real estate and never really... No, I had, to I had to yeah. decompose it. <laughs> I mean, you're like, ah, oh, it's a 6% cap market. Well, I got yeah, into it because I... It's about... Good. It's always just a guess, yeah. Know, so, but that's what it is. That's what it means. But I saw, I saw cap rates and discount rate compression of the last two cycles get really low and asset values get really high, mm -hmm. well beyond the, you know, the NOI justifications. Sure. So yeah. if you look at, you know, the intrinsic value calculations and you go, well, the value of these properties or portfolios should be X, but they're Y, yeah. it's like it's because of over-accommodative monetary policy. The Federal Reserve has printed so much money, mm -hmm. bought so many bonds, drove interest rates to zero. And actually, real rates negative after taking into consideration inflation, yeah. mm. that it creates asset price bubbles. Mm. So, it's not. It probably is not a big deal if you're a thirty or forty or maybe fifty year holder of real estate, such as a pension fund mm -hmm. that has those kind of liabilities. You can think out that far, and yeah. it'll smooth out the cycles. But mm -hmm. but shorter term investors are subjected to market volatility. Mm. So then the question is, are you buy and hold, or are you a trader? You use two different mentalities and two different tax implications. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, obviously you depreciate the, the basis in your property in 29, 30 years. Mm -hmm. So you're really almost jammed into a 20-year time period. Yeah. And the cycle's run in 10 years. Mm -hmm. So if you start thinking about the risk involved, there is a lot. There's an execution risk and, and timing. Uh, any other? It always amazes me how we shoot ourselves in the foot by compressing our own cap rates. I mean, interest rates right. aside, we torpedo our own That's you right. know, sort of economy because we pay a four cap or a three cap. For yeah, and your assumption is I'm going to get a four, yeah. or let's say three, um, and then my NOI is going to grow right. at X percent, and I'm going to get to the, my five hurdle rate in two years or right. 24 months. Yeah. You don't buy a, at a five anymore or a seven. You right. get there over a period of time. Right. If you get there. Or you never get there. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you miss the market, you don't time yeah. the market correctly. Um, you could obviously make overly optimistic NOI growth rate you know, forecast and then go under a recession, and that blows up your, your pro forma. Sure. Uh, did you want to um, focus on anything in particular? No? No, I'm just here to, you know, learn. Okay. Stuff. Let's do the 1031 exchange. <clears throat> oh, yes, let's. Okay. My client is going to do one of those, and I'm, uh, you know. Are you on the brokerage side? 
Yes. Okay, cool. Are you on com in commercial or in yes. residential? Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. Both. Excellent. Nice. So let's talk about the 1031 exchange. Okay. How much time do I have? It's currently 345. 345. And what time do you guys want to go to? I had this until 5. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So let's do what I usually do is I'll do the uh, the forecast presentation to get a macro view, and then a good view on where we are in the cycle and where we're going to go, what the risks and opportunities are. I don't know. Were you here for the, the forecast? No. Okay. I was uh, based off the the indicators and based off the analysis that I've come across, and I've been saying this for five years, almost ten years. <clears throat> that we'll probably have a, a mild recession in 2018 or 19, but a severe, another severe recession in 21 through 23, mm -hmm. because most recessions have occurred within the first five years of every decade. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's basically from a technical standpoint. Mm -hmm. But the but the research that I'm reading is saying either between April of 18 through April of 19 a recession. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm saying that the Fed still has some, you know, uh, bullets in its guns that could probably re-stimulate the economy and make it a mild corrective mm -hmm. recession. But they're not out to kill inflation, they're out to kill asset price bubbles mm -hmm. in stocks, bonds, and in uh, real estate in particular. Mm -hmm. It would be nice if they'd do that. That'd be great. If they could, for real estate people, we'd love it. Well, yeah, everybody wants the bubble. Everybody's, yeah. everybody's trying to time it, right? What's holding them up? No. Yeah. Uh, well, they're on their way. <laughs> so. Um, so the way I look at it, start with this is I basically look at the investment circle and what are your what are your investment options you know, from a multi-asset portfolio standpoint and everybody tells me don't do this but I'm going to do it anyway um, I actually think the cash value life, life insurance should be the core of your portfolio really? because you can put a lot of money into it you can borrow back on it it's tax-free, the death benefit, it accumulates tax-free. It's just an ultra-safe core to your portfolio, and you should have at least 10% of your allocation to that. The next is going to be bonds, right? And then it's going to be stocks. And obviously, real estate is somewhere in between. You're going to have commodities, and then you're going to have your business investments. As you move further out, the risk increases along with the expected rate of return. Mm -hmm. So that's where I usually like to start. And then we already talked about the cycle. So you got the 1031 exchange, right? So I'm gonna buy the property at some basis. Uh, hopefully over time, the property's gonna appreciate. Right? Uh, you're gonna be taking your depreciation allowance okay, over time, and basically within 30 years you're gonna zero out the basis. And you're going to have not only recapture, tax, 25%, and you're going to have capital gains at 20%. So if you're a good market timer, right, you can time it right. Do it right, you buy at the bottom of the cycle. Right? You get the capital, the, the appreciation component at 20%, and you've taken a little depreciation. So actually, your tax burden is very low if you can time it right. But the problem is, most people don't time it right. <clears throat> they like to hold their properties. But as the longer you hold your property, the recapture tax component risk starts to actually increase. And I know a lot of people who hold these things, their properties all the way to the end, mm -hmm. right? And they get to the, their 10, 15 year, their 30 year, they've zeroed out their basis and they have to do a 1031 exchange because they, they have to, okay? They have to because they're out, of depreciation. they're out of depreciation. You know, this is what, 45% right there? Mm -hmm. Throw on a transfer tax, you're at basically 55. Let's just say Obama tax is another 10 miscellaneous, you're looking at maybe 65%, maybe more in total taxes on the proceeds from the sale. You're screwed. You can't, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. You got to do the 1031 exchange. Right. Okay. So I say go ahead and do the 1031 exchange because you have to. Mm -hmm. All right. 
and obviously you have to be able to close in 180 days and identify 90 and you go through all that and that's really tough to do in a market mm -hmm. where you have cap rate compression and you have such high demand and lack of inventory. Mm -hmm. So if you do the 1031 exchange before you find the replacement or you do a reverse exchange, which a lot of people don't want to do because it costs them a lot more than a forward exchange, but a reverse exchange is the best way to go. You know, because then you don't, so you're not subjected to the time period. Right. But a lot of people do the exchange because they see the dollar amounts, and then they're forced into closing within 180 days, mm -hmm. which is really hard. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll go through the whole solution so you can see it. So we know now that we have to do the 1031 exchange. I say go ahead and do the 1031 exchange, and if you've gotten enough appreciation, right, you're going to do an upleg. You know, you're going to do an uplay. You're going to get a bigger property, mm -hmm. and you're going to put in more equity into the property, reestablish your basis so you can do the depreciation again and minimize your taxable income. Okay, so there's a strategy there. But my strategy is go ahead and do the 1031 exchange uh, into one or multiple properties. Now, if you're at the end of your life um, and you want out, uh, you could do a triple net leased product, uh, which again, there's risk there, and there's other alternatives to the triple net strategy, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But I say go ahead and do the, uh, do the exchange, and if you've done it right, you might be able to actually get into multiple properties. So you're not, you're not buying one property, you're doing multiple properties. Why okay. multiple? What's the... Uh, diversification. Diversification. Right. Diversification. You're not putting all of your eggs into one basket. Okay. Uh, but the, the real strategy is that I'm really trying to get to is you buy multiple properties. Uh, you basically set up the LLCs. Okay. So you set up the LLCs around the properties. Okay. And those are pass through entities. So you can you can carry reserves in the LLC, you can do some expensing within the LLCs, there could be some efficient forms, you know, mitigating your, you know, your taxable income by using the LLCs. And this is where the cash flows are going to come out, okay, from the properties are going to go through the LLCs. And the LLCs also wrap the properties and create a veil so that if you get sued because somebody whacks somebody. And you do this somebody, for a rental too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and this is com co this is commercial, okay? Right. Yeah, you want to hold it in the LLC. You sure. don't want to hold it on, as a sole proprietor because if you know somebody trips and falls or gets murdered on mm -hmm. your property, they're going to mm -hmm. sue the landlord. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the LLC, they're going to attach to the other properties and take the whole kit and caboodle. Right. So you're setting it up to, what I like to do is to set it up not only for protection, but also to, um, to isolate the cash flow. So you quarantine so the cash flows with, with the liability. Right. There's not cross collateralization. I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. okay. So once you set that up, then what you do, my recommendation, and if you look at some of the best um, real estate private equity firms around, you can go national, or you can just go in the Bay Area. Um, they all did. They all did it this way. You know, over time, they started buying more properties, and then one day they basically set up a property management company or an asset manager on top of it. And I'm going to use the C-Corp uh, as the structure. I actually like the C-Corp. It's a little bit more expensive <coughs> um, as a structure, um, but there's more flexibility in what you can do with it. And you'll, I'll show you why you would do it this way. Uh, and I do like corporate governance. I do like having a, a board. Um, I like to have the minutes. I just like the corporate governance uh, associated with the C-Corp. So you set up the C-Corp as your property management company. Now, why would you do that? Uh, because you can take basically 10% right off the top of gross potential rental income right up into the C-Corporation. Mm -hmm. So now you've got cash flows coming right off the top into the C-Corp. Mm -hmm. okay? Once you get the C-Corp, you can pay yourself W-2 income. Mm -hmm. and now you can set up a... A W-2 income that basically shows constant income to be able to go to a bank and get a business or a personal or a mortgage. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, then you can actually pay yourself a bonus. <laughs> right? 
Uh, you could probably put your family. Uh, you can hire them in the property management company too. Put them on the payroll. The one thing I like too is um, if your kids go to college and they study business and they get a bachelor's degree or a bachelor of science or an MBA uh, in business, hopefully with a concentration in finance or real estate, um, and they work for the company, the company can pay for the t tuition and basically expense the tuition through the corporation. Yeah, they just have to meet obviously the time and the requirements, but I think we can engineer and figure that out. So imagine you want to send your kid, works for the company, they want to go to Wharton, they want to go to Cal, get their MBA, costs 150000 bucks. I can basically get a 50% off deal by uh, having them work for me, the company pays for it, and I'm not using after-tax income to pay for tuition. Mm -hmm. um, so I can do it that way. Um, I can also pay for my medical, my dental. Well, because you are... I need benefits. <laughs> yeah, so you basically can, what you're doing is you're not paying for all the stuff in after tax, you're right. using the C Corp as basically the pre tax vehicle to pay for all this stuff. Um, you could also do life insurance, where you basically have cross sell agreements between the principals within the company. The company can actually pay the premiums on the life insurance and build cash value and use that as, a, as collateral to leverage then later to go into more real estate. Um, you can let's see what else do I have here that's pretty awesome by doing this stuff. Oh, you can do defined benefit. You can do defined contribution too. The defined benefit you can put up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars of pre-tax income into a, a, a qualified plan. Like a Roth IRA. It's like a Roth, but Roth is you pay the taxes. Oh. This is a defined benefit, so it's like a 401k, mm. but 401ks are phased out, mm. okay, over time when you make too much money. Mm -hmm. People who make too much money use defined benefit programs. Oh. So nice. let's say I got, you know, a half a million bucks that I'm sitting on. I only need, let's say, 250000 right, mm -hmm. to live off of. What am I going to do with the other two hundred fifty? Do I basically pay myself a bonus and pay the tax or take the two fifty? throw it into a defined benefit program and pull the money out after 59 and a half ah. or start taking it at 70 and a half mm -hmm. uh, so I can defer the tax and pay the tax in the future right. and allow it to accumulate. Mm -hmm. You do 250 grand a year, right, for eight years, you got a couple million bucks in the bank mm -hmm. if you do it right. Okay. And it's all pre-tax. How does a SEP IRA work into that? SEP is just like, a, just like this, but it's less. It's a, and it's less because it's 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 yeah, SEP is basically what do you what can you put like fifty two thousand into yeah into that thing. Some, yeah yeah these are really easy to set up and why do people do a SEP because they just throw it in there it's really easy it's easy yeah so you should do a defined benefit plan. yeah this this is going to cost more cost more but yeah because you got to add in you can pay more into it you can but you can pay more into it yeah okay so that's this another solution to basically transfer some of the money yeah out of the property up into here and then put it into this stuff as opposed to paying it out through the LLC and this is all pass through. Yeah. Right. So you're gonna be paying a lot of tax here. Yeah. So what I'm trying to do here is not only asset protect but also diversify the investment streams. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again I can only do I don't know maybe ten percent to fifteen percent of the gross potential rental income. But again, as you start to build a large portfolio, that becomes significant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, here's the other thing. Let's say that you get a reputation, right, of being a good asset management insurance team. <coughs> um, some of these other companies. All of a sudden, people are coming to you and saying, "Will you asset manage my company for me? My properties for me?" Yeah. So you start building out an asset management uh, third-party management business too. Then what you do is they come to you and they say, hey, I'm thinking about selling my property. It's like, well, why don't you sell it to me first? So now you're in, on the front lines of getting access and control to property that's not, has to go to market. Mm -hmm. So you have access to, the, to properties doing it that way too. Mm -hmm. Another way is you may say, okay, well, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna launch a fund and I'm gonna buy more property. So 
So basically, I can go it go into the market. A REIT or something? I could do a, probably a Reg D mm. uh, filing, private equity filing, and go out and raise 25 billion bucks, mm. lever it up to 75 billion, and go out and buy properties, mm -hmm. and and have it in a fund. I'll get to the REIT in a second. Okay. Because that's the exit strategy, right? So now I raise these funds. I got more properties under management, more cash flow. That's why, if you look at the Schwarzsteins and those guys, they, and Ellis Partners and those guys, they all, all, the, all the top guys at the top make a shit lot of money, right? Because there's just so much money flowing up. And where does the money go? It goes into their pockets, right? Uh, then. Into their pockets via this. All of the shit. Flowing everything that way. Here. They got yeah. the life insurance, they got dental. And they're super protected. They're super protected. This is another veil yeah. here. Uh, they get bonuses, they get W-2. Um, if they set it up as, as a C-Corp, I can also do stock grants. I can do grants and I can do options. So basically I can incentivize my employees and motivate them through uh, equity distribution with, from the company. Mm -hmm. Then, the last piece that I'll get to your, your REITs is at some point in time you are approached by a REIT. And they basically say, I want to buy the whole cake. And if you did a good job of assembling the properties by sector, and property quality, type, class, and by location, uh, if that meets their investment style and their criteria, they'll buy the whole thing. And then what you do is you basically exchange. You sell, you sell the whole thing to the REIT. Okay? And if you do a, you can do an up REIT. Maybe you take you can take it public. Maybe you just take this public. You can do an up rate. Do it that way. Or you can say, okay, here's all the portfolios. You guys take it and then give us units or shares in exchange for the properties. That's a down rate. Uh, how do you define the up rate? The up rate is um, we own we own yeah. all the properties. Yeah. We have a management company, right. professionally managed property. And what we do is we are going to basically contribute the properties into the upreach structure. And then what we're going to do, we're going to issue shares and do an IPO and trade on an exchange. So we go from a private equity firm to a public equity firm. So you can arbitrage. Uh, Bren did this down in, uh, at the Irvine Company. You know, he had all these private assets. The, the stock market was booming. He basically created the Irvine Company, which became a publicly traded company. And then at X date in the future, he said, fuck it, I'm out of here. It's like, I'm done with the board. You guys are idiots. And I'm tired of dealing with the SEC. So he bought his company back and took it private. Mm -hmm. So there are arbitrage. And then there are examples where people have contributed properties through the upreak, contributed properties where they get units and a down rate structure. People have done that, people have done that too. Um, people have exchanged properties, you know, for units within the REIT. And the reason why you would want to do that is what you do is when you get these, these shares, let's say you've, you've held these properties for a really long time, you've built this enterprise, <clears throat> I'm going to either contribute the properties into my own REIT and then take an IPO, or I'm going to get exchange the properties for the, the OP units, the operating units for the REIT. What I can do is then stick it into an irrevocable trust. Irrevocable trust. I stick it into the irrevocable trust, and when I pass away, the units are exercised, the heirs get the money at a stepped up basis. Can I ask you a question? That way you totally avoided capital gains and uh, estate tax. This is uh, this is the Bren method. Uh, well, Bren, it's not, it's not really. Ellis it's, Partners, it's, yeah, it's all the wealthiest of the wealthy, the top. Yeah, and they've accumulated. percent, call it. You know, they built they've these built things this. over a fifty-year period. So, if I can ask a question, the the bulge bracket, maybe not the right term, but the major lion's share of the people 
don't quite do it perfectly. They're not. They don't, but they can do this on a smaller scale. So that's what I'm asking. What is yeah, the smaller scale? scale? Are they? Do they carve themselves out of the up read option? They're not going to go public if they have a bunch of. No, this exit is probably. This is an institutional exit. It's, so now these are institutional. This is this is like an institutional yeah. best practice exit for the right. smaller guy after you've zeroed out your basis, right? A lot of these. Smaller guy or institutional. Small, smaller guy. This. So this is. This is the big guy. This is the big guy. This How, is the, what's the small this guy do? This is what what's the alternative? I've I've okay. spent a lot of my career on the institutional side. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's exciting and sexy, we'll call it, but it's yeah. not super practical what? for the major part of the, no, the economy. I, the way I usually when I present these are usually the younger people that need this infrastructure intellectually in their true. brain. Yes. They, so that they it's know what the ultimate, so yeah. they know what the ultimate model looks right. like. Absolutely. To work towards it. Yeah. And that's why I'm only asking for a moment just what the yeah. middle yeah. what the middle market people yeah. do. They don't really manage no, it perfectly. No, but they can still but they can they, still do this. They can do that part. Right. Yeah. They can still do that and take advantage yeah. of all this stuff. Right. And a lot of them don't. Right. They either hold it like this or as a yeah. sole proprietor. Yeah. It's just a lack of sophistication. It's right. a lack of trust. I can't advise them. Yeah. Because they're not going to believe me. Yeah. Right. Um, but even if they, they're not just that, if they're if they have all the same. You know the same property count. They're just not institutional properties that's going to go no, up. So what you, you got to do? They have. There are. There is an exit strategy, but again, it gets down to trust again. Okay. okay. And what happens usually is somebody's holding the property. Yeah. They've yeah. zeroed out the basis. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so they're looking at huge capital gains. It's either you sell it. Right. Right. Or you ten thirty one. So now so you're you're back only, to you only have like two those, options. Only those two, two options. options. Only, but there's other options. Yeah. Okay. okay. And this is where the other options come in. And again, it's lack of sophistication. Right. Okay. It is. Yeah. So I can 1031 into an oil and gas. Yeah. I can do it into an oil and gas leasehold interest. It's kind of a Roach Motel. It's mm -hmm. not easy to get in and out of these things, and you got to have a really good sponsor. Yeah. And you got to look at the fee structures, and you got to look at the business model. But I can exchange into oil and gas leasehold interests. Mm -hmm. I can also 1031 exchange into a tenants in common, a syndicated product. Mm -hmm. I can do that too. Okay. What do you mean by syndicated product? Uh, the, 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 there's TICs like in San Francisco. Uh -huh. Yeah. I these are TIC. These are large companies oh, Okay. Uh, that basically syndicate these tenants in common around special purpose properties. Mm -hmm. So there you have a sponsor that basically goes out and finds the properties. They hire the securities attorney to set up the TIC. And then they sell, you know, the, the tick units mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in an exchange or an investment form. Mm -hmm. And then the person who buys it uh, obviously is going to get X yield, you know, over a period of time. And these would be for kind of corporate These are smaller investors. Business. These are smaller investors. Oh, okay. That would invest in these TICs. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you can, under the IRS code, you can exchange. Like your a personal, commercial TIC. Just like doing a 1031 exchange. Got it. Property to property, you can go property to TIC. Okay. okay. Yeah, of course. Okay. okay. Then you can also do uh, Delaware statutory trusts. These are similar to the TICs, but a different structure, different corporate structure out of Delaware. Again, I can exchange into those two. Okay. So those are, there used to be another uh, called the um, private annuity trust. PIT, which was a great one, I could exchange into it, invest the proceeds into a diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds, mm -hmm. I get a 5% payout, uh, plus mm -hmm. I pay my capital gains and my recapture as a percentage. Mm -hmm. The assets would accumulate over time at 8 or 10%, and then when I pass away, um, it would, the whole thing would go to my heirs at a stepped up basis. No capital gains, no estate tax. Such, and I could actually borrow on the trust assets. Pull the money out tax free and go back into real estate. It was such a great deal that the IRS hated it and pulled it <laughs> in 2006. Uh, so this is gone. Okay, gone, gone. Okay. So now what do we do? Uh, so I can go into these, but you got to find the right sponsors for that. Right. So we're doing investment banking sponsored product or securitized real estate. Uh, you're offloading all the management and everything. You're rolling it over. You basically get the checks if the sponsors are ethical. If they're good. Yeah. DBSI was one who syndicated a lot of these and basically lost millions of dollars for their clients.
diligence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you really got to do the the underwriting and the due diligence if you're going to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, the other is um, the other method. There's another one uh, called the deferred sales, or no, the coupled coupled installment sales. I was trying to sell this one uh, for about a year, really hard to communicate. I can actually take the property, uh, put it into this structure, sell the proceeds, and then basically the title company and the bank work out a deal where basically I can get all the money up front, but I have a tax liability in 30 years. So I can get the money now, put it into annuities, maybe buy a ton of life insurance, to do actuarial extinguishing of the taxes that I'm going to have to pay. The trust is going to have to pay in 30 years. But I get the money. Mm -hmm. I can now use the money tax-free up until 30 years when I got to pay the tax. Mm -hmm. Okay. This one's really hard to sell. This one looks a lot like this. Um, this has been around since the 80s, but I can't, I can't advise a lot of my real estate guys. They just can't get, get their head around it. It's too, too complex. So I can't get them into that, I can't get them into that, I can't get them into that, and I can't get them into that. Is it because they're afraid of a 30-year having to pay back, or? No, it's just it's complex. Because we are trapped in a culture of property, mm -hmm. with linguistics, you know, and culture, mm -hmm. right? This is securitized. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. legal, accounting, securities, it's two different worlds. Mm -hmm. Only if you're extremely sophisticated and have a background in property and securitization that you can wrap yourself around the strategy. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of trust. It takes as well. a huge amount trust of trust. Trust is the sponsor. And, and the structure, the, the sponsor, it takes the advisor. The, yeah. Yeah. So and the that, solutions. That's where real estate people fall apart. Well, they, don't, they don't trust the Solutions the are out there, <laughs> but they're not being deployed yeah. because DBS, DB, DBSI blew that up. Right, this is now coming out. This is now gone, and these these guys n never really worked either. Hmm. So if you start to whittle it down, your your options get smaller and smaller. Right? And How are the um, like realty shares companies that are doing? Yeah, let's talk about that. Is that replacing? Is that how does that relate? Well, what I, I say know. is go ahead, you know, and do the exchange. Take up, take some of the money off the table. Yeah. Right. And if you're making money, you know, take some of that money if you're qualified. Right. If you're accredited, sure. a qualified investor. You can't do that stuff. You can't do crowd, real estate crowd funding. Not crowdfunding, but qualified investment mm -hmm. yeah. through, and I only, uh, there's a few, but I only. Yeah, we'll throw the reality shares the into shares the crowd inside. piece. You would. Even yeah, though they, because, they it's, because it's, a new, it's a new product, right? right? You're getting real estate exposure. Okay, yeah. but you have to meet a certain income and asset level to participate in it, yeah. to invest in it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so the crowd is a new offering. You can't 1031 exchange into it, mm -hmm. but you can gain real estate exposure by investing in okay. these real estate crowd yeah. vehicles. Okay, so um, not a 1031 option. No, option. and <laughs> you can invest in um, uh, private equity, equity real estate. Yeah. Reg D stuff, which is filings with the SEC, you got to be accredited for that too. And again, you got to find the sponsor of the program. Yeah. And the units are usually 100 to 250 grand yeah. per unit, but that's another way of gaining the exposure. Uh, you can go into uh, private um, closed and uh, REIT funds. You can go into that, or you can go into open end, which is your mutual funds. Uh, you can go to into private closed end or open end commercial mortgage backed securities funds is another alternative to investing. Mm -hmm. um, so these are you know you can get in you can invest directly in the TICs in the uh, Delaware statutory trusts. Outside the 
exchange. Outside of the exchange. You can invest in these things inside mm -hmm. of the defined benefit programs on a pre-tax basis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's different ways of you know, yeah. getting your real estate exposure other mm -hmm. than exchanging yeah. into real estate. So if you're really into real estate and you want a large allocation, yeah. you can do the direct side, take advantages of this. Yeah. You can do some of the indirect ways to gain that exposure for really income, mm -hmm. you know, is what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, there was another. In the defined benefits, mm -hmm. you're paying the taxes when you take it out. Yeah, so the these are called um, qualified, qualified money or pre-tax, mm -hmm. okay, and that's your SEP, defined benefit, defined contribution. 401k. Uh, the defined benefit, the, so you put the money in, right? Let's say you got two million bucks. Over 20 something years, you've contributed to this defined benefit program and you got two million bucks at the end. At 59 and a half, you can start pulling the money out. Okay. And the money's going to go to, you know, you got some. You got some income, right? So you're going to add that money on top of your income, and then you're going to pay your income tax. So at whatever really, income tax level that you're at. Mm -hmm. I've heard people complain that they have to take out their. That's seventy and a half. Right, like they have to take out money. Seventy They're, and a half. They don't want to. Because basically, the IRS has a formula, mm -hmm. and they basically force you mm -hmm. to take the money based on a formula. Now the problem is, if the money at seventy and a half is a lot, mm -hmm. yeah, it's going to push you into the alternative minimum tax level or, you can or a higher tax bracket. Um, you could, if you give it to charity, you'll get 50, 50 cents tax deduction. So yeah. I give a million, I can deduct 500 grand. Got it. So you're buying basically tax breaks mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. um, the other method, did that answer this? So you, mm -hmm. you can't overfund your qualified side. Mm -hmm. So you have to you have to sit down with an advisor and make sure that when you project it out, you're not get, having putting too much money into the qualified side mm -hmm. so that when you're forced to take it, it pushes you into a higher tax bracket. Mm -hmm. you, know, yeah. you want to try to minimize your, your tax liability. So there's a little, there's a formula for that too. Um, the other strategy um, that is pretty advanced is, uh, I think I can do it up here. How am I doing on time? 4.20. Okay. So you go through life, or your clients go through life, and they start to accumulate property. Right? Property, property, property. This is wholly owned property. This is actually fractional shares in properties, partnerships. So I don't directly own it. I own a proportion through a partnership agreement to share. Let maybe limited partnerships is a good example. So I have these fractional interests, you know, in these assets. Okay, and then I own some real property. Now the real property that I own, let's say by the time I'm 80 years old. The ideal situation is you would put the properties in an irrevocable trust. Okay. Uh, that's you're talking basically talking wholly owned direct investment versus yeah. This is direct, and then these are fractional interests. Are you are those tick investments kind of fractional? Uh, or is that yeah, just LP? they could be your LP, LP is a real. I just look at it as just fractional interests. Okay. Okay. But you, you're, you're like, you don't control it. You don't own it. You don't yeah. have really a say in okay. what you own. You're just you basically bought yield or participation in the property. Okay. So okay, with other be. investors. Yeah. This is pretty straightforward. I can just put the property into the irrevocable trust. Yeah. And when I die, it's going to go to my heirs on a stepped up basis and they don't have to pay any taxes on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, They can sell it the next day and get the proceeds and not have to pay any tax if they're underneath the estate tax ceiling, mm -hmm. which is 5.23 for singles and roughly t over 10 million for. Mm -hmm. 5.23 million. Yeah, for a single and then, uh, you know, a little over 10 for mm -hmm. married couples, mm -hmm. which is a pretty high bar, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. But anything yeah. over that, you're going to pay, you know, pay your estate taxes. Mm -hmm. So again, you put it 
you have to protect it in the irrevocable trust, okay? And then it goes to the heirs. But you still may have mortgage on this thing, these things. You still may have some mortgage or maybe some transfer taxes or stuff that may be affected if you something happens to you. But here's the, down here you have these fractional interests, okay? Now, depending on what your cost basis was when you bought these fractional interests, um, when you pass away, you're, you're probably going to have a living trust. You know, but the living trust just allows you to circumvent probate. It doesn't, you don't get a stepped up basis. It just tells you where the money mm -hmm. is going to go, where everything goes. I bet you don't, uh, you don't have the government messing with you in mm -hmm. probate. Mm -hmm. So you still have, but you, but you still might have some leverage or something. But the problem is, is if you pass away and the cost basis of these things are below right, the market value. Mm -hmm. It's like a big time. You could have a tax liability. Mm -hmm. You could have a tax liability. Mm -hmm. So there could be, and then if you have to, so you gotta, you're going to have a tax liability here. Right? And if you sell these things, they're highly illiquid. You need to sell them to pay the taxes. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is, is if you sell them, they're highly liquid, you're not going to get enough proceeds to be able to pay the taxes. Mm -hmm. Basically, what you did in this case was you left your heirs a tax liability, mm -hmm. is what you did. And there may be some mortgage on this stuff, too, or leverage, or you might have leveraged it some way. So in both situations, you'll have less of a tax liability here, but maybe a mortgage liability. Here you have a large tax liability and maybe a low you know, leverage liability. So how do you solve this? Well, the way that you solve it is you set up what is called an irrevocable life insurance trust. An irrevocable life insurance trust. And you basically take the income streams from the properties to pay the premiums. And the premiums are basically on your life. Okay, so you want to get this, you try to get this in place when you're young and healthy. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you get as much life insurance as you can. But the way that it's set up is you're going to get less return on your property because you're paying this premium. Mm -hmm. But if you pass away, the life insurance policy pays the life insurance, the irrevocable life insurance trust. Then the trust basically distributes the proceeds and extinguishes the taxes. Mm -hmm. So that this goes to the heirs tax-free mm -hmm. because the death benefit in the life insurance policy extinguishes the taxes. Mm -hmm. And you, if you buy a big enough death benefit, it can also extinguish the mortgage debt or personal debt, mortgage debt, personal debt, so that the whole kit and caboodle goes to your heirs tax and debt-free. Mm -hmm. And how are you using the term extinguish? Because the Meaning life insurance policy on me pays it off. I have, a I have a four million, five million, ten million dollar life right. insurance policy on yeah. me. When I pass away, yeah. the trust gets the proceeds, yeah. and, the, and the trust extinguishes the taxes of the mortgage. Hey, the personal the tax tax. Mortgage bill. Takes yeah. out all the. Yeah. It's going to take out the taxes here. Yeah. There may be a little here, right. but it takes out and extinguishes the liabilities, the tax, yeah. and the mortgage and the debt liabilities, and the whole kit and caboodle mm -hmm. goes to the heirs, yeah. debt and tax free. That's the ultimate strategy. But it's so just bled all, all along. It's just bled premiums to build up. Yeah. That. So your 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 net premium rate of return, net of premium cash flow. Yeah. Right. Cash on cash, yeah. cash flow. Yeah. Right. Because you can't expense the premium. Cannot. No, you can't. Yeah. Okay. So you're paying for it. So it's a kind of mortgaging. Your you're tax lowering your your now. cash on cash returns. Which right. You're doing. Yeah. Uh, but again, what you're doing is you're mitigating the tax liability and the liability on a transaction that would be triggered on death. Mm -hmm. So you have it all in place. Yeah. So it becomes autopilot. This takes a while to, to set up. Mm -hmm. High net dudes do this stuff. They have this stuff. The medium, mid-market people don't have it. Right. They should understand it, sure. especially when you're young and healthy. Mm -hmm. How would I end up with a bunch of those? These? these uh, well, these, these, I have property, so on the other side, I'm not even sure what that is. I mean, I see Which that it's real one? estate related. No. 
I see that it's real estate related property, but it's it sounds like it was securities. This is only yeah, these are like limited partnerships mm -hmm. or partnership agreements. Okay. So that when you pass away, mm -hmm. um, those securities or those securitized interests don't really have a, a liquid market mm -hmm. to sell into. Mm -hmm. But your heirs need to sell those those interests to pay the tax liability. It could be as simple as you're a 50-50 owner of a single family home. And so it's a joint venture. And so that's what you mean by illiquid. You can't go out and sell your half of the interest rate. Either. Yeah, so somebody else is going to have to take you out. Somebody has to take you out. It's a recapitalization. So, they're gonna, so what they'll do is they're going to buy you out at a discount. Yeah, at a discount possibly, yeah. That's right. And because the you have a partner who's not really, really ready to sell at that moment. So that's, there is, right. so that's what that's the, right. It can be very complex, or it can be very simple. It's just a simple 50-50 right. single-family home. That's right. You could, and that goes in that bucket, that's and it's right. illiquid. That's, that's right. why. Yeah, it's, oh, that's it. I see. Yeah. Okay. So this is for all of your property, but it's not liquid. I thought yeah, that this is your property. Direct out of this. Is, this these are your fractional shared or yeah. partnerships and stuff. Got it. Right. Okay. And you, get, you want to have the living trust set up yeah. mm -hmm. so that it doesn't go through probate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you want to make sure, you know, I really like this setting this up. I mean, I spent four and a half years in, you know, the life insurance business. And I've been 25 in real estate. I like to mix and match mm -hmm. products and strategies to try to make, you know, mm -hmm. better strategies, mm -hmm. right, by combining products. So it's really a, it's almost a, in finance, it's called a synthetic solution. You're basically piecing together products and multiple strategies to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. the, the problem is a lot of people just don't have the intellectual curiosity, you know, to be exposed to this for the first time, but also then take this intellectual infrastructure and build on it going forward right. and continue to learn it until you become comfortable and then find the right people to help you execute on it when it's the right time. Because you need accountants, and attorneys on the business, on the tax, trust side, you need advisors, your broker, you know, you, you're brokering your deals, on the, you're doing the real estate, and then are you going to manage the, the properties yourself? No, exactly, exactly. Um, I think, that, is that the whole strategy? Pretty much to my understanding. I think that, I, think, I don't think I left anything out, I think that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the piece you were looking a lot. <laughs> so usually what I do is I, I, I did break it down into two lectures, mm -hmm. a forecast lecture and then the advanced real estate portfolio strategies. Mm -hmm. But for you guys, I just combined them okay, so together. Okay, so in the very beginning of this, you referenced the 1031 may go away. May go away. And so, t so, yeah. so talk about that for a minute. All this becomes irrelevant. That's a good question. When, yeah. I, I mean, I forgot well, about that in the very beginning. You basically, said, what it does is if you get rid of the 1031 exchange, it forces you into depreciating the property, right? Yeah. Zeroing out your basis yeah. and forcing you to pay the taxes on the, on the trade. It's right. basically forced taxation. Forced, yeah. Right? And it takes away uh, a lot of the uh, estate planning yeah. mm -hmm. component. So you might, you probably, that was the one thing that I didn't talk about, was on the, ex the failed exchanges. Well, what it, what it does, and what's interesting is, is I have a theory that Prop 13 goes away, possibly could go away, and that would help, and this 1031 would help in the same way because it forces liquidity. It forces, it forces properties onto the market because right now, with this structure, people never sell, ever. They just hold on for a lifetime, our lifetime. No, they really, would sell. It, they would sell at what point? I'm trying to figure out. Oh, well, the ideal situation is you try to sell before your, it goes on to your heirs. Before you recapture. Yeah. But, right, you, but you your heirs are going to sell it. Well, your heirs years. may sell, they, but they, they don't, they they don't, they don't want to keep the property. If I, if I got a property yeah. from my parents, yeah. and I'm a doctor, or I'm a, an attorney, yeah. I'm not going into the real estate business. No, they'll I'm probably take, liquidate. That's I would fair. take that. Five million or the ten yeah. million bucks that I'd buy guaranteed annuities, so, and just have the money come in from the yeah. New York Life or Northwestern, and just yeah. just receive checks every month. Yeah. Say, forget it. I'm you not going to deal simplify with it. that way. But if ten thirty one goes away, it'll force some onto the market. It'll force properties onto the market. If the, if Prop thirteen goes away, it will also force properties onto the market because it, it 
forces people to pay higher taxes, steps up their taxes more right. real time. And so those two factors alone is my one of you know just one of my non vetted theories mm -hmm. that would smooth out the a little bit of the the asset you know sort of asset hoarding that sure. we see. And I don't sure. know if that's what they're trying. Is that now? That's what is that what what they're oh, trying tax to do? Tax so they're, they're trying to capture tax. They're trying revenue. to bring. I mean, you got twenty bring revenue. Yeah, you got twenty trillion in yeah debt outstanding. Right. You got they probably pay about eight hundred five hundred to eight hundred yeah. billion a year in interest. Right. Um, you know, if you get tax cuts, infrastructure, yeah. you know, health. Care, mm -hmm. Let's not do healthcare, just infrastructure and yeah. uh, tax cuts. Yeah. You know, along with the ongoing budget deficit of roughly uh, of roughly eight hundred, five hundred to eight hundred billion a year, and then the prospects of higher interest rates is going to exacerbate the budget deficit. And you have entitlements. Mm -hmm. You have people getting older. Yeah. You know, so the entitlements. I'm surprised they haven't raided the real estate industry long, but long ago. I mean, that's well, if you look at corporate income taxes yeah. as a percentage of the total tax revenues, yeah. it's actually really low. Mm -hmm. It was really high, and it's actually really low. They complain about the actual tax rate, yeah. right? But if you add in all of the tax deductions, your effective is extremely lower. Mm -hmm. So the a percentage, corporate tax revenues as a percentage of total tax revenues is, is really low. So it's actually, that's where you go to get it. You get real estate, and you go to uh, corporate taxation. Yeah. That's where they're going to deductions. Get. But they're going to give away yeah. tax deductions now, yeah. right? And then at some point in time, they're going to have to raise taxes to pay down the debt, mm -hmm. or at least pay it down or mitigate it, because right. the interest yeah. just on the debt is getting so large, mm -hmm. it eats up everything else that becomes a self-perpetuating. Oh, devaluating the currency. Devaluing the currency? That's what would happen. Is if at some point in time, if the debt loads get too high, although I'm shocked that it hasn't happened to the yen yet. Yeah, <coughs> well, if you look at the yen, it seems like we have a long way to go. Well, you know, the only reason why the yen is held up and it actually is appreciated is massive capital flows coming out of China, yeah. going right into the, the Jap uh, Japanese in economy and particularly their banking system. So the yen's been propped up due to capital flight, mm -hmm. not due to excessive sovereign debt. Okay. But we thought for sure that Japan would probably at some point in time default on their bonds right. because they don't have enough tax revenues to pay nope. the interest on the bonds. But, but they continue to print money. To pr yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it could, it could blow up any day. And China's next. I mean, China has yeah. huge debt lo levels, yeah. uh, particularly on the corporate side. Which are government-owned entities. Mm -hmm. So you got their central bank printing money, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. buying these corporate bonds, yeah. propping right. up the bond prices, keeping Pretending the cost of capital time. low, mm -hmm. right? And then you have, and these corporate bonds are, are government-owned mm -hmm. corporations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So actually, I think China is a huge opportunity for debt for equity swap and privatization, massive privatization, open up the economy. And basically, um, do debt for equity swap, and allow American and multinational corporations to come in and restructure their whole economy. So you'll take on Chinese debt. You get in in exchange for equity. Right. In their equity, I, I, in yeah. ownership in their companies. Sure. Okay. At a discount, because a lot of these companies are already bankrupt. Oh. They're just keeping them afloat. They just pretend to. Look Why don't you want to step into that? Because a lot of these people can probably buy a whole portfolio of companies and yeah. restructure them. Okay. And then take them. Uh, public again, Make them, uh, take, put them, take them onto the exchange. This okay. has basically been the model, yeah. you know, the global capitalist model, mm -hmm. for like 30, 40 years. Because you have these it. closed economies that open up to trade, mm -hmm. open up to capital flows, mm -hmm. and then with they've, they've, they've accumulated huge amounts of sovereign debt, mm -hmm. and, it, and, and a lot of that debt is invested in their own industries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they do a massive liberalization and privatization mm -hmm. of the economy. That then brings in capital, brings in expertise, and they basically restructure and they grow out of it. Mm -hmm. So the Southeast Asian e economies are probably good models of that, mm -hmm. and some of the Eastern European countries mm -hmm. have gone through that. It's pretty persistent across. Brazil did it, Russian did it, Russia did it, Southeast a Asia did it, Eastern European Europe mm -hmm. did it. This is basically the model. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be considered a heavily um, 
hedge fund, it's a very sophisticated sort of a hedge fund strategy. It's not for the average investor. It's no. somebody who can go buy equity, trade debt for equity, and then and then bring a company back on its feet, go public yeah. again. I mean, and it seems very, very The way we would participate is through ETFs okay. or mutual funds. Yeah. And um, yeah, okay. that would be buying yep. publicly traded equities you can buy on, on their exchanges. But the people executing that are really going to be... Those are the investment you know, bankers. Bankers, yeah. yeah. Is really the yeah. yeah it's institutional right because they bridge that they straddle that sort of investment versus execution they, yeah. they can buy the company and fix the company yeah. not just invest from a distance yeah there's so much mo money now yeah after Don Frank yeah that flew off the bank's balance sheets into hedge fund structures mm -hmm. but there's a lot of speculative capital out there right. that would be licking their chops mm -hmm. to get at some Deep, deep discounted debt, Chinese debt, Chinese. and and get at get at some of their uh, their business portfolios. But I, I don't know if that's feasible politically, right? Because the Chinese are very mm -hmm. yeah one party control. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but well, they may be forced into that at some point. Why are, why have hedge funds not been doing well recently? In recent uh, months, structures. years, whatever it is, fee structures. Fee. So they're two and twenty. Been, I know. Yeah. I heard just recently they're one and a half and twenty. Yeah, and they're they're, kind of they're, the, coming they're coming down. They're coming down. They're being, but it's really hard to beat the market. I mean, if you yeah. believe in the Fisher market hypothesis, right? Um, basically, states that all information that's available in the marketplace is yeah. already embedded in the price. So if they re if they fix their fee structure, if they went to a one and ten, that would probably be easier. Easier. They could compete. Plus, you know it's what they're expensive. doing. What they're doing is really labor intensive. Okay. You know, to be able to underwrite a yeah. company or underwrite yeah. a, a large distress it is. issue. It's, it is intensive. You know, you've got to underwrite it. It's a lot of cost. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And if you make a mistake, it's a huge mistake. Yeah. You know, and I think, I think a lot of them just couldn't put enough money out. They couldn't find the right deals. It's too hard. They were sitting yeah. on a lot of capital that needed to be yeah. deployed. The fee structures ate into that, plus the opportunity cost of holding yeah. that capital and not deploying it. Basically, the pension funds said, "Screw it, we're we're out. We're not we're divesting from the from the hedge funds." But they haven't adjusted their fees down much. I mean, they haven't taken any hits. I mean, in a in a in a no. in a bad in a worse market, fees typically get squeezed down. Yeah, whatever it's a fees. private market. It's a private market, but it's still a market. I mean, it's still yeah, but it's still, I don't know, it's still a private them. market. I mean, that's yeah. why everybody's moving towards indexation. And so they're leaving the hedge funds behind. They're basically not, they're holding firm on their fees and getting yeah, left I mean, behind. We're, we're, <laughs> I'm building a product right now that will basically, um, we're going after core real estate allocations. Yeah, from pension Three, funds. From pension funds. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and most pension funds don't even have real estate in their portfolio um, because they don't understand it and it's too expensive. The private equity guys charge too many fees. Right. Right, and most of the times they don't get to their yeah. number that they need to hit to yeah. fund the liabilities, yeah. and it's more cost and intellectually and labor intensive to manage real estate than it is the stock and bond portfolio. Yeah. I only need one manager for the fixed income and the in the public equity. I need ten guys, right. you know, on the real estate side right. to manage ten percent or less of my yeah. my portfolio. So it's like, why am I putting out? I'm not getting the returns. I don't have really liquidity. I'm getting feed to death. Why would I even have real estate in my portfolio unless somebody comes up with a different product? So that's what we're trying to do is to, uh, we're gonna create, we'll have it launch probably within the year. We'll have a product that basically allows them to get their real estate core exposure um, using a, a securitized instrument. But your pension fund advisors are not charging that fee. They're not charging that much. I mean, they're, just, they're relatively... Yeah, our fees are going to be really low. Yeah. But the, the pension fund advisors are, I mean, the, the, the yeah, but the half move, a percent. The movement's mm -hmm. going towards yeah. indexation securitization. Yeah. You know, an ETF model. Mm -hmm. You know, where I could get on a managed portfolio yeah. of equities, if I do a good job, I could charge 150 to 250 basis points. Mm -hmm. But if I do a passive index strategy, yeah. I can charge 50. Over here, I got yeah. two billion. Over here, I got twenty. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather have, you know, yeah. I'd rather have fifty basis points on yeah. twenty billion than, you know, two hundred fifty basis points on two. Yeah. So it's kind of the economics and where things are moving. Mm -hmm. 
Any other, did you have any other questions or anything? No? I, I answered all your questions. The, the, um, I'd like to see the video when it's done, if you have it somewhere. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I can, I'll give you I the deck, I missed the too. forecast part, and that seems super compelling. Yeah, the, uh, I can show it to you real quick. Okay. Okay. What's, what did you miss? The forecast. The forecast. What's the forecast? This is the cycle forecast. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. In the, very, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. like, okay, yes. When I was being like, mm -hmm. I think the Scientology people, is not right. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, the That's first funny. thing found the red place, though. <laughs> the, the first thing was that do you understand what a yield curve is? Um, well, I've Yields I've gone through the four cycles maturity. before. You know, so mm -hmm. Yield maturity on government bonds mm -hmm. by maturity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the longer the maturity That's for the bond, mm -hmm. the higher the interest rate. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do know that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that that is, in my view, the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. okay, understanding, mm -hmm. because what happens is, is these yield curves, mm -hmm. they're, they're normal, upward sloping, mm -hmm. they flatten and they invert, mm -hmm. so they go like this over time, okay. over the cycle. Mm -hmm. When they're normal, very low probability of recession. Mm -hmm. The recession starts to increase, the probability is the Fed starts to raise interest rates, and currently because the, the Trump trade is basically uh, it's not around anymore. I mean, the, the, the yield curve shifted up, okay, when Trump was in, was elected because they thought he was going to get deregulation and mm -hmm. stimulation and tax cuts right. and all mm -hmm. that stuff through, right. which would flow through to the economy. Mm -hmm. But once everybody realized after the debacle of the health care mm -hmm. bill that he wasn't going to get a lot of not this stuff through. Mm -hmm. So what happened was the yield curve on this end started to come down, down. because inflation expectations were and the Fed's concerned about uh, real estate price bubbles and stock price bubbles, mm -hmm. that they're raising interest rates on the short end. Ah. So what I was showing here was here's the yield curve against the S&P 500. Okay. And what happens is the yield curve, if I can, uh, we'll let it cycle through, <clears throat> but usually what happens is in these periods right here, leading up to the peak, and stock prices and real estate prices peak at the same time. They're related because mm -hmm. they're both mm -hmm. equities. Mm -hmm. As you move closer and closer to the peak, mm -hmm. the yield curve starts to flatten. And right before the peak, every single time, the yield curve inverts. Oh, and once it inverts... Invert. And that's like a big sign. So that's like, the sign. That's okay. the sign. That's what everybody's watching. Got it. So because the Fed's raising interest rates, the short end's coming up right. because the the lack of the Trump trade now and the, and the threat of disinflation and deflation because mm -hmm. the economy is not growing fast enough, the long end of the curve is starting to come down. So the curve is flattening. Mm -hmm. That's the first That's the first indicator. Got it. And then the Fed usually, uh, they've admitted that they usually oversell the bonds mm -hmm. and cause the bond prices to go down and interest rates to go up further mm -hmm. than they should because they screwed up. Mm -hmm. And they usually end up inverting the curve. And that pops the bubbles and sends us into a recession. Right. So, so we're in the first, basically, first few innings mm -hmm. you know, before we get to the recession. So to we're the thinking recession. 18 and 21? So, the, 2018 so 2021. The, the, the indicators that I'm seeing are telling me, and I've been saying this for even longer than that, mm -hmm. is that the recession will probably hit a mile between April of 2018 and, and April of 2019. Mm -hmm. But we'll probably be in a severe recession in 2021 through 23. Okay, and the reason... There's the little curve. Oh yeah, so you can see it. So you, so you see as you... As the, 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 the Fed's trying to pop this bubble. Right. So it's selling bonds, driving up interest rates, and then all of a sudden... It's right about there. It's going to invert like right, right there. there. Yeah. Okay. So that one was really close. So that, it heavily inverts, yeah. Wow. So you can see it's really inverting. And then what they do is they start to panic. Oh. The Fed starts to panic, printing a bunch of money, buying bonds, oh, driving okay. up bond prices, and they start to drive down interest rates to keep oh, the market okay. from collapsing right. with real estate mm -hmm. prices and stock prices. Right. So they try to set a floor. Uh -huh. And you can see the peaks, it peaked at the same and bottomed yeah. 
at the mm -hmm. same level. And you can go back in time and it's the, the resistance and the support are embedded. They're almost structural. The support's pretty bad. That structure is pretty low. <laughs> yeah, but if you go back in time, you can see that they all bottomed out around yeah. the same. That's okay. catastrophic. And they peaked around the same. It's just this was deeper and more severe. Right. And this is unprecedented. We're, we have a long way to fall here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's because the Fed printed so much money. <laughs> well, I'm going to sleep well tonight. Well, what you'll see, what you'll see is, yeah, when, we, is when we get to here, uh, when we get to here, we, I mean, if you just look at the, the wave, the spacing, we should have peaked right there, right? Yeah. And we should have been well, already into a recession. Created this huge but what, bubble. But what happened was, what you'll see as we start to get here, is that the yield curve is still extremely steep. It hasn't flattened that's or where, inverted. That's where they screwed So money up. is still super, super cheap, cheap. Yeah, exactly. which is pushing down cap mm -hmm. rates and pushing up valuations. And that, and that overvaluation is, that, that's, that's is the concern of the Fed. And that's an that's a political thing. It's, it's a monetary policy. Monetary effect. policy. It's a monetary policy. But effect. partially driven by politics. No, monetary not, policy. Not driven by politics. Monetary no. policy. The Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve basically controls the economy. It so stimulates it. Politics in influencing the Federal Reserve. No, you don't. I mean, no. The, the Fed is very independent. Uh, it's to manage the economy. We thought the FBI was independent too, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that, that's true too. <laughs> no, but you can see how steep the curve is right here. I mean, basically, short-term interest rates at zero. It's really steep, right? So you would think, once we started to get here, similar to these last cycles, that the the curve would have started to flatten. But there's no flattening in the curve. The Fed is holding interest rates extremely low. Yeah. But the problem will be is they've already said that they're going to start raising short-term interest rates. And the long-term interest rates are starting to come down. And they're going to have to sell off the balance sheet. They have a $4.5 trillion balance sheet. Oh, right, like the debt. Yeah, they've already... The, the foreigners are already selling U.S. Treasuries and the Fed's selling U.S. Treasuries, mm -hmm. which will cause the bond prices to go down and interest rates to go up. Mm -hmm. So it's coming. And then the last piece of the forecast, yeah, I could just watch that all day. It's pretty fascinating. <laughs> it does Yeah, I, I showed that to my students. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Because they, in my classes, they learn finance, but they don't learn economics. Economic cycle. So here's the last piece, and then we'll call it call it quits. Is what I did was I went on a monthly basis. I calculated year over year changes, going back to 1940 for employment. I could use industrial production. I could use GDP. But I wanted to use a monthly number and I wanted to use employment because employment's the number one factor that basically drives everything, particularly real estate. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what I did was I went from 40 to 50, 50 to 60, bisected it, and then broke them up into five years. So 45 to 50, uh, 50 to 55, so I broke them up into five years. And then I coded all the recessions and I coded all the growth peak phases in the business cycle going back to 1940. Mm -hmm. And notice that all, almost all of the recessions occurred in the first five years of every decade. Hmm. So I calculated a 90% probability that a recession would occur in the first five years of every decade. And most of the growth peak phases occurred in the last five years of every decade. So there was a 70% probability that would be in growth peak in the last five. It would be in 90% probability we'd be in a recession in, in the first five. So if you back out of it and you go, Oh, there's high probability of a recession between April of 18 to 19. Okay, but it's still in the last five years, mm -hmm. so it'll probably be a mild recession. But the real big recession is probably going to be in 2021 through 23 because it's happened 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. How many years is that? How many years is 2018 19? To 21, isn't it three? Yeah, I mean, we're t it's right around the corner. It's a very short. I'm just saying that you got to start putting together your plans, your defensive plans, of start planning your business strategy mm -hmm. in a defensive fashion. 
right. for a probable recession next year, right. but a severe recession within the next three to five years. Right. And your portfolios need to be immunized and, and defensive also. Right. Get your ducks in a row. Yeah. So you got to go back and review your business model mm -hmm. and then your portfolio strategy. Make sure you don't have to sell your house. Well, the, the key is, is also you put through a defensive strategy. You go back to the bank, you pay oh, down your debt, you get your lines of credit in place. Yeah. When the thing starts to turn, well. you've got the balance sheet to go back opportunistically in the marketplace and buy the equities and mm -hmm. buy the real estate mm -hmm. because your balance sheet's in shape. And you're going to be the best credit for the bank. Right. And you'll be right there to execute because your model will be fixed. Right. It'll be ready to go. All right. So that's all I got. Here's my... Uh, Thanks. Yes, thank you. I'll give you Derek's. So I, you, I grabbed both cards. Oh, okay, cool. I did. Not. That's so me. This is okay. Larry. It's Derek. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. And then what company do you work for? And the Lynn Volkers. Is that yours? No. Oh, no. Okay. It's just um, my brokerage. Okay, nice. Yeah. So I, I work with them. Great. Yeah. And then what do you, what's your product specialty? I think I definitely thank sell you. more yeah, residential than do commercial, but okay. I try to do both. Great. You know? Excellent. Yeah.